I, I basically don't know how to start with drums because I have... You just say the word Okay, drums. let's start with drums. It just kicks yeah, it off. Drums, that's the best way. Otherwise, I would say, hey, let's start doing like the Mayumana stuff and all the blue, blue men. Yeah. And then, it, and then it gets weird because we have to figure out how to do this with very little video window. I know. Well, uh, I, yeah. Well, I've been playing for 25 that's years. So, that's impressive. Yeah. So eventually, it, uh, you know, I can play on anything now. It doesn't matter. The sink, the dishes, pots, pans, official drums. It doesn't I thought matter. that this is usually a, the way that you start as a kid, like, Take a little bit of cutlery, put like the different, dr um, I don't know, pans and vines, just like go like this with cutlery, no? Right. Oh, no, that's exactly how you start. In, in my case, my parents bought me a pair of drumsticks. Uh -huh. um, and then I set up pillows because it was quieter. And so drumsticks on pillows was my official first drum kit. That's a, worked that's a brilliant idea, man. Actually, come to think, that could have been... I. Maybe I could have been a drummer instead of a failing, uh, a failed guitarist, especially because I insisted of playing like a righty instead of a lefty. Man. Um, but that's like part of, that's part of your, your special panache as a, <laughs> as a human is you're left-handed, you're playing right-handed. I'm the same way with drums. I'm left-handed, but I play drums right-handed. Mm -hmm. That's like interesting. It's different. How does it, why does it, how is it different for drums? Do you have like the set the other way around or? Yeah, so it, when you play right-handed, um, your right hand crosses over your left okay. when you're on the hi-hat. Okay. And then all the drums go to your right from there. Mm. And then when you play left-handed, your left crosses over your right and all the drums go to the left. Gotcha. It makes, it makes a ton of sense when you see it. Okay, so I think that I finished with the Fender hat, although I always wanted the Fender. I had all kinds, I had Ibanez, I had a couple of other uh, Spanish style, I have the the ukulele here, but somehow for one reason or the other, I never managed to buy a Fender or a Les Paul. Gibson Les Paul, that's another type oh. of a, you know. Legendary. They are, they are. But okay, this is enough for me. Okay. No. Oh, look oh at that, we, we have the same I name. know, it's like my COVID <laughs> haircut and age and jeans and all kinds of other reasons. But Alex, welcome to the InsurTech Talk. Thank you very much for joining me. And, you know, give me a little bit uh, the ability to make one or two jokes about myself and, of course, talk about uh, drums. Um, you are based in Ohio. How's, how's That's right, Columbus, uh, Ohio. The capital of insurance, or one of them at least. How many capitals of insurance do we have? Well, I think uh, there have been some really successful markets for InsurTech over the past mm -hmm. few years. Columbus is definitely in the mix. Uh, just like I'm in downtown and just behind me, uh, if you know where to look, you can see the offices for Bold Penguin, for Root. We're here, of course, in Beam HQ. Uh, Matic is based here. Branch Insurance is based here. And we're all within walking distance of one another, uh, which is really fun. So it's like a great little ecosystem here in Columbus. Hmm, I have a feeling that we need to organize a small event soon enough in Columbus. Maybe we'll wait for the spring. I'm, how's, the, how's the winter there? How cold is it? We're worse than LA. <laughs> That's for um, sure, man. But a lot better than other places. I mean, it's not, it doesn't get Chicago cold mm -hmm. or Buffalo snowy. Uh, so it's not okay. bad. Okay. We'll... Not bad. But we can wait for the spring. Let's let's wait till it warms up. Let's do like an April InsurTech. That activity. sounds yeah. Spring in the what can it be? Yeah, because spring it will go to the south. We can. What, what's good? Uh, what will be a good thing for Ohio? The prairie or what? What will be? What will be a nice uh, good question? Um, if it was Michigan, we'd go like, spring. hey, high five. But, uh... ooh, ooh, ooh. Well, Ohio is shaped like a heart. Oh, so we could yeah, do okay. I heart in SureTech. Love it. But the heart is just Oh, my Ohio. God. That, that can work. 
that can work most definitely. There we go. And we'll get a, a few imperial <laughs> penguins walking around, or Ilya and uh, interviewed the Shaquille O'Neal in ITC. And yeah. yeah, let's why not? Let's grab a um, you know, win. Hmm. Who would you invite, right? So you've been around for I would say. What is it? Almost 10 years raised, say, north to 170 million. One day you will need to do your your exit spec or whatever that may be. Are you? Who would be your NBA player? Ooh, I'm a gigantic LeBron James mm -hmm. fan. Also an Ohio guy as well. Grew up in, in Akron or Cleveland. Um, so LeBron's first on my list. And if I can't get LeBron... I'm also strangely a really big Dennis Rodman fan. Interesting. Well, he and the choice. He's uh, Dennis Rodman's just one of the most interesting people on planet Earth, period. And uh, and I love his playing style because he had true grit. He did all the dirty work, focused on rebounding and defense, which made him indispensable as a teammate, mm -hmm. even though he barely ever scored. You know... I think that's great. That's a beautiful analogy for team player and how you build a team and not just, you know, stars. Because when we think about, well, again, I'm I'm not really up to date, so I'll use Magic Johnson, Rodman, and Jordan for this analogy. Each one of them had it, his own magic. Even Karim Abdul-Jabbar at the end, you brought him in to make the points or just to tower over everyone with his hook shot, right? right? The fact that today is a philosopher, a book writer, a, an academic is mind-blowing, not in terms of a, a surprise, but he's truly a remarkable person. Uh, those guys, Rodman especially, it's very interesting to see how you get that person into a team to have a team. And not just, hey, here is another star. It's like uh, Pippin and, um, oh man, I forgot his name. Yeah. But please, jump in whenever you want to talk about insurance. Otherwise, we can talk about the 80s and the 90s. Yeah, we could, yeah. Do, we could talk basketball yeah. the whole time. Uh, well, there is connectivity there, actually, to Beam, because that team player analogy is actually something we use in a, a culture deck that I built and maintained for the team. So inside the walls at Beam, we do talk about Dennis Rodman and we talk about um, being a great team player and being incredibly tenacious, which is one of our core values as a business. And we use Dennis Rodman as the specific example, because in my mind, he really is such a memorable version uh, inside a sports analogy, at least a memorable version of somebody who clearly wasn't the, the star that Michael Jordan was. And he wasn't the guy shooting the shots and scoring the points and winning the MVPs. Yet, everybody would agree that he was a critical member of the team because he did all of the necessary things that don't get the glory. He did all of the rough and tough work uh, that was uh, critical to winning the games and winning the championships. And so when you're constructing a team, Sometimes you're the star player and you score the points. Other times you're playing a supporting role and everything is necessary if you're going to win the game. Yeah, I think a lot of it is about um, the concept of a finite game or an infinite game. And a company is like an infinite game. It never needs to end. But we're playing all these finite games inside of the business all the time, which is trying to meet our monthly sales goals or uh, achieve an NPS score with our service teams build and launch a new product, whatever mm -hmm. it is. And so people are driven to try to construct teams to win a game inside the walls of the business. And therefore you have to construct a, a winning team in order to play and win that finite game inside of the business. And we try to remind people that you might need a Dennis Rodman from time to time, which is that not everybody's going to be running the thing, leading the thing, et cetera, they're going to be contributing, but be a really critical member of a team. Yeah, and I think that I will add, let, let's add a little bit of color to that, that first of all, you need to be that person before you start to create, you know, to add all kinds of colors and 
let's call it weirdness or charm, really depends how you look at that, if you like it or don't. So get the sheet together first, then add all the different L, L style, etc., etc. And then if you're good enough, maybe you'll date uh, Madonna and start a conversation with North Korea because you need to be a really special person, a, a person, you know, another orbit, another level to start to have a conversation with North Korea. Why? Because you're swimming against the stream. No one wants to do that. But hey, there are a few tens of millions of people that live there in a very awkward position. But let's not go to politics. <laughs> Impressive uh, extension of the analogy, though. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Listen, the guy was amazing, right? Besides the, the fact, in the, and we are moving. This is the end of the, the conversation about Rodman or the NBA, right? In not just as being a basketball player team member, but all the colors that the hairstyles and things that we, we haven't seen in in baseball earlier. And that's it. That's enough. Okay, mm -hmm. let's talk about it because it's way more interesting. Okay, what let's yeah. do it. What causes a person to wake up in the morning and start a PPO? In dental insurance. Yes, in dental insurance. Well, we have an anagram here, which is more about vision, but we don't see too much of that type of products in the insurance sector. As you mentioned earlier, Root, Ball Penguin, commercial insurance, PNC, even life feels a little bit uncomfortable at ITC, and we are trying to push and to bring more and more life and health. But PPO, dental, Columbus, please. How did you reach that? Well, we didn't start uh, the business with a specific interest in building an insurance company. That's actually, I think, one of the most interesting parts about our founding story. My two co-founders and I are engineers by training, and we have no background in the dental field, in insurance, or in group benefits at all. And so we actually came with very much an outsider's view of the industry focused on solving a problem. And the problem that we saw was actually through the eyes of some of our family members uh, between the co-founders, including my sister, who's a dentist. And she ended up marrying a dentist, uh, one of the other co-founders, his mom's a dental hygienist. So early on in our careers, um, the three of us had started our first business together. And that was just a very simple, like, uh, engineering consulting company. So we were doing whatever our clients asked us to do. We said yes to everything. We were doing technical writing, custom electronics work, um, lots of um, website building, anything we could get our hands on. And it was really, really fun. And however, there was this missing piece. We wanted our own product. We were doing, we were building somebody else's ideas. We wanted to build our own ideas. And so my sister, who was in dental school at the time, kind of turned us on to, hey, look inside dentistry because there appears to be lots of interesting technology and things to build and things to do and problems to solve inside of the industry. And when we looked under the hood, we totally agreed. What we saw was a really big, really fragmented, sleepy corner of healthcare that nobody is ever talking about. And we could see all these innovators in other parts of healthcare in pharmaceutical drug discovery and medical devices in healthcare IT, now, now what we refer to as digital health. We, we could see all these other people building companies in healthcare, but nobody was talking about dentistry. And so we decided to make that our core focus is, can we help modernize this industry, bring it into the 21st century? The joke in dentistry is that it's 10 years behind healthcare and the joke in healthcare is that it's 10 years behind everything else. So it needs that modernization. And that's still true today. We're still chipping away at that problem as a business. But the way we went from being generally interested in modernizing the field of dentistry to getting into uh, insurance and ultimately building a PPO dental plan for employers was seeing that the influence of insurance and insurance product design on how care is actually then delivered to the end um, insured or patient. And so that became uh, an interest of ours. But again, we didn't know anything about insurance. So we ended up raising a round of venture capital 
uh, here in Columbus when it was still the three of us and our first employee. And we went to school, back to school. And back to school meant learning from zero everything about dental insurance and about group benefits that we could get our hands on. And we ended up building our own dental insurance company from the ground up, really, that focuses on prevention through connected electric toothbrushes. We can chat about that. We built a whole unique approach to underwriting and risk management uh, based on machine learning principles instead of traditional actuarial techniques. And we built a digital version of the dental insurance that's been out there for decades. And you're right that in ITC or just in the insure tech landscape in general, there's a lot of activity in some of the higher visibility lines of insurance coverage. Lots of activity in auto, renters, home, commercial. There's very little activity comparatively in group benefits, which thankfully is starting to change now. Uh, but Beam has been fully focused on delivering value as an employee benefits business uh, since we were founded back in 2012. That's very impressive. And I'll be more than happy to talk about uh, the toothbrush because hey, how many companies do you know that, sorry, how many insurance companies do you know that build their own IoT devices and even actually and linking them and creating some sort of an incentive for the users to use it. Now, in terms of uh, the benefit, so how did you move from dental to benefits? Was it just to, to create a better distribution channel? Yeah, definitely because of our distribution channel. So we work with brokers uh, in 43 states around the U.S. now. And when we showed up, we were, a, you know, a dental only company and the brokers loved the product and they took, took it and, and ran with it immediately. And still the biggest piece of feedback that we get today from our, our broker partners is thanks for digitizing dental insurance. Now, can you please do it with everything else? Because they have the same problem um, with, with all employee benefits, really, which is that the lack of digital infrastructure makes a lot of the back office and the administration of policies very labor intensive, slow. Um, there's lots of data issues, right? Synchronizing um, eligibility and billing and invoicing and managing claims process. Bro brokers hate it. So they have to end up staffing a lot of people at their brokerage just to chase all the information and make sure and audit everything and make sure it's all correct. It's not that productive. So you've got people. So just take dental insurance as an example. There are people that work at a dental office full time that focus on mm -hmm. coordinating with insurance yep. companies. Right, collecting the money, filing the claims. It's actually a profession. There are right? people. It's a, prof it's it's a profession. profession right? Cod coders. Uh, you need to go right? to study like two or three months to become a, as you said, a coder or a, a medical billing. Yeah, it's like medical billing yeah. and coding. Yeah, you got it. So that's like a whole segment, right? And then you've got people that are employed by the insurance carrier that just are on the receiving end of all that information. And then you've got people that work at uh, an employee benefits brokerage who are further coordinating with insurance carriers and providers. This is not very productive. And then, by the way, at the employer, there's probably somebody in HR that is a benefits specialist as well. So there's a lot of labor expended in the coordination of just all the different entities talking to each other and making sure that the right information is landing in the right person or the, at the right entity at the right time. And we think there's a better way. This is a, you know, a set of issues that have been solved by digital infrastructure and lots of other industries at this point. And I don't think the purpose is to like totally um, automate somebody out of a job in this equation. I think there's going to be a human in the loop uh, component to all of this, but you can certainly give any of the people I mentioned, any of these roles, a ton of leverage by providing superior uh, digital infrastructure in an amazing customer journey that makes it really clear and obvious how to successfully complete a task or go through a workflow. And that's a big focus of ours across now, not just dental, but we also do vision, life, and short and long-term disability as well. With more products on the way, we're really starting to think of ourselves at Beam as an employee benefits, a digital employee benefits company 
not just a dental insure tech. You just took my follow-up question because I was about, oh yeah, you know, I did my research, looked at your website, this is where it is, and then the follow-up on that will be, are these your programs or are you using someone else's paper? And what does it mean for your brand? Because you open the website, you need to serve three different types of customers, right? You will have the, uh, the brokers, you'll have the insurance companies, and of course you'll have uh, the employers themselves. And from there we can roll all over the place. And the biggest question will be, okay, so what's your future brand? Because you are now in a direction to become benefits. Originally you started with, with dental, where are we? So, and of course, where are you going with that? Right. So today we, we have expanded well beyond dental. We're working now to reflect that more in how we communicate our brand to our customers. We think that's a really important, uh, important piece of the puzzle. Um, that'll be starting to become more explicit uh, here in 2022, which we're really excited about as a business. And, you know, we want to make sure that we are solving problems for our customers. That's where all this came from in the first place. And so our true north is making sure we stay focused on delivering value for the customer. And value uh, can express itself in a handful of places, but it must be understood that Beam is the one delivering that superior experience and solving those problems. So regardless of whose paper the policies are written on or who's doing some of the back office um, activities or even whose um, plans and products are being leveraged, Beam has to, in order to build trust and credibility with our broker partners on the distribution side and the employers actually buying these policies, they need to know that Beam's brand and brand promise is standing behind all the things that we offer. So we're very curated, very curatorial in how we approach our program design because we've crafted over years and years, really crafted this superior dental experience. And now we're going to add uh, products at a really um, amazing velocity, really quick velocity. And so we need to be careful that that velocity doesn't sacrifice the brand promise and the quality experience that our customers have learned to expect from us and deserve. Okay, so I'm going to use that to link the toothbrush because that's part of the experience. It's like, so it's totally. something new in, I would say that PNC, we, we see uh, the different uh, telemetrics for the car, you know, UBI, maybe leak detectors and a couple of other IoT smart home for the home toothbrush. Tell me about the toothbrush. Uh, the beam brush is uh, the first connected electric toothbrush, and it's a big piece of how we've communicated a few different concepts at beam. One of those is our focus on prevention. That's one of our core tenants as a business or how we would articulate our value proposition. Easy, smart, and preventive. Easy is the digital infrastructure, smart is our approach to risk and underwriting, and then prevention is all about giving people the tools they need, like toothbrushes, um, to have successful long-term dental outcomes. But it's not just about giving somebody a toothbrush and walking away. In fact, lots of dentists do that. After you get a cleaning, they'll give you a little uh, toothbrush and a little mini toothpaste, right, and send you on your way. Yeah, which is nice. It's a, it's a very... Uh, you know, there, there's value there and there's um, uh, connectivity between care delivery at the point of service, which is at the dentist's office, and then the small healthful action of daily dental hygiene. And, and I think that's a really important link um, for the customer to make in their head because it affects their behavior and then ultimately their dental health. But Beam wants to go way beyond just giving you a toothbrush. We want to give you a high quality toothbrush, first of all, and a high quality set of um, oral care products, right? So what's the best toothpaste? Let's make sure we're delivering that. Let's deliver a high quality toothbrush. Let's also do things like floss and other preventative care um, dental goods. And let's not even stop there. Let's add connectivity to the brush so that way we can actually allow people to basically demonstrate via their usage of the brush that they represent um, strong behavioral and preventative habits that are going to yield long-term dental health. 
this is exactly the, what telematics does in auto insurance, which is prove I'm a good driver. I'll show you that I'm not slamming on my brakes or rapid acceleration or swerving all over the place. Um, this is much the same idea just adopted into dentistry, which is if you're taking care of your teeth consistently, the brush is pulling that data um, and displaying it for your benefit as well as allowing Beam to reward you for it. And that's where things get really exciting is it's not just about getting you a brush, a high quality brush, or even uh, giving you some signal on your preventative care consistency. We want to reward you for it. And what that looks like is every day when you brush your teeth, you get points. And those points add up and accrue, and then you can redeem them for prizes. Everything from like replacement heads for the brush itself, which you can get for free just by displaying strong daily dental hygiene uh, habits, or uh, gift cards uh, to Starbucks or other popular retailers. And what this connects in the user's brain is that they're playing a game. And the game is every day when I brush my teeth, I'm making a little progress toward a prize. And then every once in a while, I get to redeem the prize. And that creates the interest in keeping your streak going, which is the consistency of brushing twice a day for two minutes, like your dentist is always telling you to, and uh, allows Beam to build a, a relationship with the customer with this daily touch point. And that daily touch point over time not only creates the health outcome that we want as a business, it also creates uh, our ability to stay engaged with a member and let them know that we see them taking great care of their teeth and we're happy to reward them because they're also helping us build a more successful block of um, insurance and, uh, and, and risk. You're actually trying to take care of your policyholders, which is, it's fantastic. We, we can't really see that in terms of, hey, you know, you should drive better. What's your left turns? You, your timing is a little bit off. I, I can't really see that happening in car insurance anytime soon. It's like, uh, how about we'll give you a few credits uh, that you'll take a, a driving ad again. It's like a small inflation. It's just between us. Or even better, uh, there is the Porsche or in Vegas, they, they have that uh, supercars uh, track that you can, the racing cars. We'll give you a coupon. Yeah. Go go get wild over there and come back to us. Get your the steam out of the system. Yeah. And what you're speaking to is actually a really great point that I think is worth emphasizing, which I like to think of as the number of independent variables at play when we're thinking about outcomes. And one of the things that has been really successful with telematics in auto insurance, for example, is that there has been provable evidence that uh, having collecting all this information and parsing it does allow uh, an insurer to better understand and manage risk. It's also true that there are so many more variables that are currently not captured by what telematics would want to do, which is a truly holistic picture of driving behaviors and, um, and, uh, and, and outcomes, essentially, because uh, the sensors don't exist yet, or we, can't, uh, we don't have the compute power, or we can't elegantly understand all of the variables at play, environmental and otherwise. It's a really hard problem. Uh, healthcare has the same thing which is, man, we are still learning so much about the human body. It's very difficult to predict, oh, you're going to have a heart attack in 14 days from now, and I'm not, right? Because we just don't have all the information we need. And, you know, what a Fitbit or an Apple Watch accomplished today with steps and some basic readings on um, heart rate, et cetera, it's better than what we used to have a decade ago, which was nothing, but it's not nearly enough to be able to actually understand how the body's changing over time and, and predict adverse um, issues that may pop up. Dentistry is much closer to understood. The mouth is very complex, but it's a lot simpler than the whole body. And there are fewer variables at play than there are in the dynamicism of driving a car on a road with lots of other cars. So 
simply understanding something like brushing your teeth every day isn't just uh, a fun game to play. It is also a pretty strong predictor of what is going to happen with your dental health and claims that will be filed in the future uh, versus lots of other fields of insurance. And there's something elegant in that simplicity and there's something valuable in that simplicity that we're leveraging in dental insurance that I think is very hard for other companies to leverage to the same extent in the more complicated um, and higher visibility lines of coverage. Yeah, I think that let's add a couple of other things there and then we can move to a different course. Because apparently this is now a pattern for us. We'll, we'll talk, then I will extend that conversation and then maybe we'll move to the next topic. And yeah, I love it. Yeah, man. It's like, it works. Um, in, from my understanding from dental, it's a clo- almost a closed map or it's a, you control what's, let's, what's going into your mouth and how you take care of what's going on there. Cars, you're on a road, different roads, uh, different conditions, different drivers, the environment conditions changing, winter, summer, different states, right? Uh, There are too many things that, or there are many variables that going into that formula. And as a result, we see all kinds of different insurance companies picking whatever the linear regression told them we should look at that, right? They're coming with a certain thesis, they explore it, they are checking it. And every from, I would say, once a year, every six months, they are changing whatever they can within the limitation of the filing. And you mentioned earlier how strong you break. or and So even that, right? If you are breaking a Honda Civic versus um, I don't know, an Escalade, there's a difference between the the brake and how much that car will continue moving. And then we see more and more different patterns from the different routes, the condition of the road. But again, it's, I don't know, I, I already took it into a direction that will not help us at all. So I'm going to cut this topic here and we'll just move there because I can just continue blabbering about it for hours. So maybe we should. It is worth pointing out. Yeah, it is worth pointing out as as we wrap it up that the best, most careful driver in the world can still get hit by another car. Just bad luck. Uh, Somebody maintaining their home perfectly can still be in the path of a tornado or a hurricane. And the most, you know, somebody might run a, a marathon every weekend and could still have a genetic issue that gives them long term chronic disease or cancer. So uh, oral health is so much more direct in the actions you take to maintain your, your dental health, brushing, flossing, daily care, so much more direct in the, the outcome that is achieved by that daily care um, than, than those other examples. And that allows us to be actually quite effective and efficient at understanding risk and managing it appropriately. Employee benefits, I think, have never mattered more. Uh, the especially portable benefits that stay with the person, more and more teams are being built remote. The connectivity between coworkers has been much harder than it was previously because we weren't all located in the same physical space. And so employers are really struggling with, and then there's the topic of the great resignation, which has definitely been... Uh, a, a hot topic this year, right? And and so employers are really struggling with attracting the talent they need to be successful, retaining their existing teams, and not just retaining people, but retaining happy and engaged employees. And benefits is not going to be the, you know, silver bullet answer to that question. There's a lot of components that go into happy and engaged teams. But Benefits are definitely a piece of that equation and and perhaps a big piece of that equation. We're seeing more and more employers excited about innovating with their benefits design when previously they would have reflexively fallen back on incumbents and the tried and true carriers. So one of the most common uh, reasons Beam would lose a deal 
that we were working on with uh, an employer that was considering Beam is, oh, you guys are so new. We just, you know, we've been with uh, Delta Dental for 15 years and we know what to expect and it just feels low risk, right? Because we know exactly what Delta Dental is going to give us for better or for worse. So even though we love what you guys are doing, we love the toothbrushes, we love the risk management, we love the digital infrastructure, it's too big of a risk. That attitude has shifted a ton in the past year, 18 months. The pandemic has forced a lot of employers to start asking themselves, well, if we're offering a, an incumbent for our dental benefits or for life and disability or any of our products, is that just going to be increasingly perceived as check the box, right? No, there's nothing special. There's nothing different. There's nothing new. There's nothing interesting. It's just same old stuff. And result of this macro shift, which is slow, but sure, it's like happening, um, is that more and more employers are looking for uh, what Beam represents in dental, vision, life, disability, and other products. And then I think it provides a huge opening for lots of other startups who are taking uh, a fresh look at other employee benefits, both uh, established benefits products and some emerging ones that maybe are making their way into the employer sector for the first time. Are you planning to add new products? Because you mentioned the uh, disability, you mentioned life, then we have long-term care. Is that one of part of your part of the plan? Yeah, in the next 12 months, uh, Beam will add more products than ever before in our history. And it's going to be a mix of established employee benefits and some what I call emerging employee benefits. On the established front, we're going to be adding some additional life and disability options, as well as supplemental health, uh, which is accident, critical illness, hospital indemnity, products like that. Um, that helps surround your core health insurance product to make sure it's a robust offering. And then there's a variety of different experiments we're going to be running that I'm really excited about with emerging employee benefits, which might focus on, uh, these might not be insurance products necessarily. Uh, they might be more perks or fringe benefits that help an employer uh, offer a set of benefits that employees can take advantage of and get value from without it being necessarily about protection the way insurance is it might be more about consumption or uh, a true like value added experience so how about fertility ivf and other services i know only one employer based in chicago uh, that is providing that that services why why don't we see more of those it's a great question I think uh, fertility benefits is a great example of what I would call an emerging employee benefit. It's starting to get out there. There's more interest than ever before. Um, I think the expense is classically a reason why employers shy away from it. But frankly, not all of these uh, products need to be employer sponsored. They don't necessarily need to bring the money to the table to pay for the benefit. They just need to make an offer, like a voluntary benefit, essentially. And that's already relatively popular in the uh, employee benefits world. It's just, it goes back to that digital infrastructure point I made earlier, which is that an employer would theoretically love to offer a hundred or 500 different benefits. The problem with that is that causes so much pain and effort and labor on the employer's end uh, to coordinate the benefits then and for the broker as well. And so the broker, on one hand, could see a ton of commission opportunity um, if they're offering 500 different benefits to the employers and therefore the employees. Uh, but the reason why they don't do that is they don't want to have to figure out how to do enrollments and get quotes and do claims processing or back-end management and eligibility checking and billing and invoicing and coordinating commission payments. That's so complicated. So when Beam introduces more benefits, whether we go for 500 or not, I don't know. But as we add more benefits and make a more robust product mix, what we're keeping front and center is making sure that the experience for all those stakeholders 
remains really simple, easy, highly automated, low effort. Because if that isn't true, then employers eventually are going to go, look, I'd love to offer a fertility benefit, but I just don't have the bandwidth to deal with it. I've got my hands full with health insurance, dental, vision, et cetera. So that's really important. That's super important, especially in love the fact that you're looking at that as the emerging benefits, not just fertility. Fertility was a specific example to a trend that I see. And you mentioned earlier at the beginning of the trend, the, the big uh, uh, that everyone sort of quitting their job nowadays because of the pandemic or as a result, because we've seen a huge shift in the economy in the past 12 years, basically since uh, the crash in uh, 2008, What's going? We started to see the gig economy, the different type of what let's call it millennials, or really depends how you dice uh, the market, how the level of education, the types of jobs, and the commitment from the employers, and the benefits started to be the change. Right? There were uh, there was a time that they offered yoga, which is more of a perk with the in work uh, food, da, da. but now with the pandemic, it took it to the next level of. How do we see career, lifestyle, and what we need in order to survive the modern age? And by modern, well, post-2020. You, you got it. And uh, that, that's perfectly put. And we're going to remain very experimental here because I don't know all the answers. I think this is a very fast-changing market. We want to be open to lots of different options and opportunities and feedback from brokers and employers that we work with. Because the, the environment's very dynamic out there. Uh, what you said about the past decade or so is very true. The uh, millennial influence on the workplace, which now the millennial generation is the largest cohort of workers uh, in the U.S. And that's going to be true, I think, for the next 20 years or so. So increasingly, the question is, well, what do millennials want? What, what benefits are attractive to them? And that answer, that set of answers is going to definitely be a different set of answers than it was a generation ago for their We need to remember, and they are not kids. They are in their 30s. They are homeowners. They are parents. Uh, oldest, millennials. Yeah. oldest millennials are now like 40 or 41 years old. I mean, it's, uh, I think even I, a millennial, um, think of millennials as kids because that's how we're commonly portrayed. But the youngest millennials are college grads, the oldest millennials are 40 and, and yeah, they've got a house and kids and live in the suburbs. It's a lot different than uh, how they've been classically characterized and are still thought of in, in media. Yeah, for example. They, they moved out of Brooklyn and Silver Lake. It's not part of yeah. Some of them are still there too. It's a big generation. It's a big generation. There's a little bit of everything in there, but you know, Millennials don't get pensions anymore, for example. Uh, that used to be, for a millennial's parents, that used to be a pretty standard part of your service and loyalty to a business, was that you would have a retirement benefit in the form of a pension. Millennials have never expected a pension. They don't get pensions, except for maybe very rare cases. And um, what they expect from their employer in exchange for their loyalty and engagement um, is going to be a different set of answers than, uh, you know, I'd love uh, health coverage and a pension, please. And that was probably the answer uh, of the generation previous. Uh, now it's a different set of insurance products, perks, benefits, and um, other experiences. And Beam is very excited about continuing to explore the, the full breadth of that ask and then delivering it in a way that makes uh, life easy for our broker partners and the employers that we're supporting. I really wanted to keep this conversation short because I know that you're a very, very busy person and we already had the 45, 47 minutes in. So let me ask you the last question that I ask everyone that comes on the podcast. Can you please give us a recommendation? It can be a book, TV show, a life hack, something that you picked up since March 2020. Ooh, since March. I was going to say TV show Succession, but I've been watching that one for since before 2020. Um, so I read a great book 
last year, and I'm actually rereading it now because I love it so much. It's called Americana. And the subtitle is something like a 400 year history of capitalism in America. And the premise of the book, and it's very easy to read. It's not academic at all. It's actually really fun. It just tells stories starting at the Mayflower, the pilgrims landing on Plymouth Rock, all the way through to basically the past few years and stories of entrepreneurs, but also the context in which entrepreneurs or enterprising people made their way and built the America that we know today, a place famous for its entrepreneurship, of course. And it has such fascinating stories around how influential um, tax policy and the geography of the United States and uh, slavery, of course, early on, um, po political issues in Europe at the time, and a bunch of other factors all mixed together and created uh, what has been such a successful set of entrepreneurs and value creation and um, capitalist endeavors for the United States for a really long period of time, for 400 plus years. And not all the stories are meant to communicate. It, it's not passing judgment saying like capitalism is great or capitalism is bad. It's just telling these stories to show you the context of what your history classes growing up didn't teach you about why the Boston Tea Party moment was such a big moment. Everybody knows the Boston Tea Party and they dumped the tea into the harbor and they were protesting something about taxes from the British. That's what you get told in your history class, but this goes into depth about why that tax was contextually so unpopular in America and why people like a George Washington or a Ben Franklin were really interested in pressuring this point in this moment with in this case, the British Empire. It's such an interesting book because these are all familiar stories. It's going to talk about the founding fathers. It's going to talk about the uh, the Gilded Age, you know, the Vanderbilts and the uh, Rockefellers and the Gilded Age entrepreneurs. It's going to talk about um, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs uh, toward the end of the book um, being more recent. So these are all people you know, but you don't know all the context and all the stories behind what made them so important historically, and it's all told through the lens of capitalism, which is just a really interesting take. And it's a really, really fun read for anybody that likes business. I think that, you know, we are recording this in November 9th. I think that Elon Musk now is the richest person in the world ever, which means he already passed a Rockefeller, even if we are using the infl inflation and stuff like that, um, which, hey, that will be maybe part of uh, the second book because everything is about context. Yeah, and uh, the scary part, right, is, um, you know, it took Rockefeller his whole life to reach, right? And Warren Buffett has classically been right there um, and he's 90 something now. Elon's like 45. Elon's not that old. <laughs> he has a long way to go if he wants to, meaning that, you know, I think there's still a very bright future for SpaceX in particular uh, to create more value and become a much bigger company than it even already is. So uh, he might just be getting started. Yeah, man, I don't know, but I'm I'm more than happy to see what's going on, uh, to observe. Hey, maybe we will even join that one time, but who knows? It's most definitely the economy became such an interesting part of our life more and more. Not just, hey, can we make money, da, 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 but from crypto to the leaders that lead it from a technology and from a economic, and you know, it has bigger effect. And we have huge challenges to overcome, not just space, environment and other things and how we deal with pandemic and information, right? But, you know, Keeping it in a positive uh, note, Alex, thank you very, very, very much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been so much fun and uh, thanks for doing it. A parting thought is exactly what you were just indicating with the positive spin on, on where we're leaving things, which is whether it's in insurance 
or insure tech or in healthcare or lots of other problems the world faces, you have two fundamental views. Either these are problems and nobody can fix them and we shouldn't even bother, or every problem is an opportunity just waiting for the right entrepreneur to come along and invent the next thing that helps us thrive as a species and take the next step forward. And that's the world I like living in because it's a much, frankly, it's a more fun and a much more optimistic way to look at it. Now I need to add another thing. This is one of the biggest problem. I talk with amazing people, entrepreneurs, investors, etc. that see those problems and those challenges, no problem, challenges, and they think about the solution. And I would love to have the ability to help each one of them because there are so many great problem solving value providers out there and yeah i wish that we could help them all because then humanity would be in such a better place or at least yeah agreed okay now goodbye for real ciao thank you all right yes. we gotta stop <laughs> thanks man see ya